Oh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Gemma Brown. I'm the Client Services Director at Stratton Craig, and I'm here to host um, today's webinar. So thanks very much for joining us this morning. Um, our topic today is creating content for effective globalization, insight from the front lines. Um, at the end of this webinar, we hope you feel your you would have picked up on a few tips um, that will help make sure your content is connecting with your global audience and is translation ready if required. Um, so without further ado, I'll start to make some introductions to today's uh, panellists um, who will be taking you through our collective insights. So joining me um, from Stratton Craig is Claire Wilson. At Stratton Craig, we specialise in rich incomes for, every, from, um, for everything from social media posts through to website copy, annual and sustainability reports, as well as additional content strategy services such as tone and voice, SEO and writer training. As head of copy and strategy, Claire leads our writing team and has a wealth of communication experience, both agency side and in-house. Um, and we're delighted today to be joined by our co-hosts, Emily Decker, head of client partnerships, and Dan Jacobs, head of client delivery from our brilliant translation partner agency, Comtech. Comtech specialist localization services help clients create multilingual content that uh, global audiences can truly resonate with. We've had the pleasure of working with Emily and Dan for several years now on joint client projects. And I think I'm yet to find a language that Comtech can't um, provide. <laughs> that sounds like a challenge, Gemma. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to quickly cover our agenda today, Claire uh, will start with an overview of why uh, global content matters and some tactics for getting it right. We'll then move on to considerations for cross-border tone of voice and Emily and Dan will round, uh, round everything off with some tips on setting your translation project up for success and some best practice guidance for translation management. Um, we'll also make sure we allow enough time for questions at the end, so please feel free to use the chat um, and I'll try and cover as many as possible um, once we close off. So I'll hand over to you, Claire. Brilliant. Thank you, Gemma. Um, I think there's a bit of a delay on the slide, so just bear with me if it's going a little bit slow. Um, now, obviously, I think it's pretty clear to understand why global content matters, um, but it is interesting to us to be talking about this today because we're seeing so many more of our clients looking to have their content not just translated, but really, um, you know, uh, adapted um, for different audiences in a range of different ways. Um, and I guess one of the things we want to talk a little bit about is about how important it is that we don't just look at that as a simple direct translation task. There's so much more to understand. Um, and from our point of view, that's where Comtech and our partnership has really come in handy in terms of adapting global content for clients, all kinds of clients. Um, but we really are seeing um, people looking to become more globalized. It makes sense, you know, we're in a changing world. Um, but uh, according to some uh, research survey from last year, I think it was an HSBC piece, nearly half a million UK businesses are now looking beyond the UK's borders for growth and for their next opportunities and for the next opportunities to scale. Um, and those that are already trading overseas are looking to grow even more in those spaces. So where are they looking to expand to? Primarily Europe um, is a key target, despite some people's perceptions, um, but closely followed by the US and Canada, and then China, obviously, for obvious reasons, people are really looking to grow their presence in emerging markets, um, where the demographic growth for the, for the future generations is going to be. Um, there are, of course, other areas of focus, but these are the ones that really stood out for UK businesses, and they're the really ones that we're seeing a lot of demand for. But the other thing that we're seeing as people are trying to enact their sort of global ambitions is that becoming more globalized presents a range of challenges, not just for logistics in terms of setting up operations in new locations, but also for communications. So this is what we're really looking at today is how is it that you speak to a global audience whilst maintaining a central brand, but adapting that content in a way that's going to resonate with lots of different audiences with their own sensitivities, their own priorities. Um, we really feel that this is a balancing act, one that's difficult to get right, um, finding the hook that's going to resonate with all your audiences, but without diluting the brand is a really difficult challenge, but one that's really important to get right for businesses that are looking to succeed um, in this space. So just a little bit more in terms of that opportunity and that future that we're seeing in this space. Obviously, demographics around the world are shifting. Um, we some use some UN stats um, to build this slide, um, but they predict that 
over half of the global population growth in the next 25 years will be from just nine countries. Um, and those countries are US, India, Indonesia, Pakistan, Nigeria, Egypt, the Congo, Tanzania. Um, sorry about the circles. We should have let our designer have a look at this before we went live. He's probably online now. We'll get a message later. Um, these countries are ones that are going to experience a swell of younger people. Um, and that means more people at working age. And that means more people at purchasing age than other countries. Um, we know in some countries like Europe, for example, we're experiencing much more of an aging population, which means there'll be fewer people working, not in the key purchasing demographics. So it makes sense that companies are looking to capitalize on these opportunities. Um, but I guess at the same time as um, looking to target these markets, those markets are becoming more global themselves and those audiences more sensitive um, to when they're being fed global generic content. So I don't know if this happened here, but growing up in Australia, we used to always get American ads repurposed with a bad Australian voiceover. But you always knew it was terrible because the loop sync was out and the teeth were way too white. Um, that's an example of where you haven't necessarily understood cultural con connotations and tried to repurpose generic content, not necessarily connecting with the audience. So what we wanted to talk a little bit about today was what it is you need to go through to get global comms right. Um, and we have a lot of experience in doing this. And we found that the secret really is in preparing yourselves um, as thoroughly as possible um, and understanding from the outset what some of those challenges are going to be. So the key is that translation on its own is not enough. So phrasing needs to be culturally sensitive as well. Um, by directly translating some phrases from English they won't work well in other languages and you'll miss the nuance that you're trying to convey. We've got a few examples of that coming up that I'll talk through. Um, cultural considerations can even affect format as well as words. So for example, uh, colors can have some significance in different cultures. Red is lucky in China while white symbolizes death. So it needs to be avoided. Um, and in Japan, for example, you never write a person's name in red as that's how grave markers are written. But without levels of that sort of cultural understanding, brands can easily get something wrong if they're just translating their brand directly to a new market. Um, copy also needs to reflect the brand. But again, a direct translation of this um, isn't necessarily going to do that. Um, there's an example uh, in terms of even within English. So English spoken by different countries has different uses words differently. So a cool brand in the UK wouldn't use the word super, for example, but it might work in the US where that word has different connotations and they're used in a different way. And then finally, um, the real challenge, um, and we really look to our partners at Comtech to help us on this front, um, large scale translation project projects can involve a huge number of stakeholders. Um, it really is like herding cats in some situations, and all of them might have opinions on the language, um, where a straight translation is far too rigid um, and doesn't allow the flex needed to suit different audiences. So really, this is the kind of nuance that we're grappling with, um, but there are ways in which you can get it right, and that's what we're going to have a look at today. So firstly, it's about getting the content translation ready. And this means taking the time to make sure it's in the best state possible before you even start to go to translate it. And this, by doing this and getting these right, you can reduce the amends rounds hugely. And that becomes a real challenge if you're translating content into a range of different languages. So it's fine to do a couple of rounds of amends on a piece of content in one language, but if you're translating that to 25 languages and one change at the outset then needs to be flowed in, you can imagine the, the challenges that creates. So I'll be having a look at how to do that in the next few slides. Um, cultural expertise, now that's where Comtech comes in and working with a translation agency that has cultural and language awareness across markets is what's going to help you ensure that all of your work lands really well. Um, and the real priority there is that they work with native speakers um, and they also have extensive language experience themselves, so they're able to then check. Um, sense check when that um, translation is working when it hasn't worked. And then finally, and obviously we would say this, um, getting experienced partners um, in your translation efforts is really important because it helps to work with people who've been through this process many times themselves, um, understand the pitfalls, and then importantly, how to avoid them um, from the outset. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how to make content translation ready. So for us, this is very much about keeping it simple. 
So global English, we always say to our clients, is plain English. But by that, we don't mean oversimplified or dumbed down. Instead, there are a few rules you can put in place to make English as translatable as possible, as global as possible. So that means you keep sentences short. Um, we've said aim for 10 to 20 words here. But that means doesn't mean every single sentence sounds short. That's that can sound really staccato and not necessarily natural. It is about mixing up the pace of sentences, but being really clear that um, very long sentences are going to be a problem without going into too much grammar detail. Um, really long sentences can introduce challenges for languages that are more, more wordy. So German, for example, you know, where they tend to pile adjectives on top of each other rather than have distinct words can end up with very complicated words if you uh, if you haven't kept the language simple. So that's why we say avoid complex sentences with lots of clauses, don't use too many commas. Um, we also recommend splitting up paragraphs to keep it digestible. And the last one here is a bit of a grammar point, but avoid the passive voice. Again, it's one of the things in English um, that tends to add complexity and word count um, when it comes to translating something. So the next thing that we really are careful to sift out um, in terms of base content is cultural elements that you may not be aware of. Um, we're just going to have a look at a few different examples within English where we may not necessarily understand the source of the words, um, how they might translate, um, and whether there are any different connotations to the words we're using in different languages. So... These are a few words that we may not necessarily understand the origin on. So paparazzi, for example, this came from the film La Dolce Vita and was the surname of the photographer um, uh, that pestered the film star in the film there. So this one is fairly well known and I think it's got global usage. But again, we haven't considered necessarily some of the connotations of the origins of these words. Bombshell. Well, this one comes from a 1930s film called Bombshell. Who knew? Um, but in English, it's clear that we might mean that as an extremely attractive woman. It's not necessarily clear in other countries that that's going to have the same connotation. Or there may be sensitivities around if it's actually someone that's a war zone, would you use language like that, for example? The friend zone. Um, now, this, I think, is believed to have been coined by the series Friends. Um, and again, in the English uh, culture, certainly English and American, this is very accepted and understood and we'll understand straight away what that means. Translating this may not be the case. And foregone conclusion. Well, apparently this one came from Shakespeare. Um, so again, something that feels very natural to us in English to talk about, but may not translate as easily or have the same immediate recognition um, in other languages. So uh, the next example is that we try and weed out is really idiomatic language. So uh, again, some of these feel very natural and straightforward when speaking British English, um, but they may not be in a, as accepted use in English or uh, sorry American or Australian English, for example, um, and they may not have any meaning whatsoever when translating to other languages. So bees knees, I think that's obvious. Sling your hook. I didn't even know that one, I think, when I moved to England. Um, it's raining cats and dogs. I mean, try and explain that one um, to somebody that you're translating that to. Um, all ship shape in Bristol fashion. This is relevant for us, based in Bristol at the moment. Um, but these all have very specific cultural origins, which make sense when you're in touch with the history and the culture of that. Um, location, but you wouldn't necessarily be able to translate that into a way. So that may, is one of those reasons why a direct translation really doesn't do the job that we need to. We really need to be looking at the nuance, understanding what it is we're trying to express and translating that in a much more sensitive, considered way. Um, the other one that we always encourage our writers to do is to double check common phrases. So even some of these may not look as immediately obvious as some of those idiomatic phrases, but can be just as problematic to try and translate. So, so far, so good. Pull yourself together. Miss the boat. Better late than never. Or to add insult to injury. Um, these are very literal and they make sense, but they wouldn't necessarily convey the same connotation when translated into a different language. And scrap the slang. Now, this is one that um, 
when we're working with writers, it's very easy to forget what's slang in your own language and what might not be understood in other languages. Um, I always use the example of having moved to England from Australia and not understanding what an MOT was. And then I kept asking people what MOT stood for and it turned out nobody else understood either. But they all know what an MOT actually is. Um, but the kinds of words that um, are borderline don't necessarily feel like slang when you're using it. These are the kinds of things that can trip up translation. So we've got some examples here, dodgy. Now that's not something that Americans use, for example. Bloke or lang, lad, again, um, doesn't translate well. Chuffed, we don't use that in Australia even. Gutted, um, very British specific. And even something like loo, which we do use in Australia, but I know the Americans don't. So it really does give you the, I guess, a sense of how much this everyday language we use all the time could be problematic when it becomes used in communications for different audiences. So just to reinforce that point about American English versus everyone else in the world's English, um, there are really some words that they just don't use at all. And if you haven't got experience of living or working in American culture, you may not necessarily know this from all the television that you watch on TV. So these are words that Americans just wouldn't use. For example, pop. They don't pop to the shops. Um, most people probably know they don't use jumper, um, but they might not know that they don't really use purse. They say strange things like pocketbook. Sorry for any Americans online. Um, and chips versus crisps. Obviously, as an Australian, I know that one, but it took a while to get used to. Um, but there are some words that they just don't use in the same sense that we do, or they might sound really forced. Lovely is an example of that. It feels a little bit twee and cheesy for an American English. So these are some of the things we consider in um, for Stratton Craig's point of view in terms of writing global English. It's really about having that sense of awareness about um, how idiomatic our language is, the words we use that don't translate well, and taking a really disciplined view of what they are and then how best to manage that. So now having a look at cross-border tone of voice. So this is really that challenge that, again, you really need an expert partner to get um, your culture across as well as just your language. So tone of voice is so important in terms of communications. It really adds personality to a brand. Um, it, it helps to uh, capture and express a brand's unique selling points, connect to the audience as it wants to. And we work with a lot of... Uh, clients to help them develop tone of voice in English, but that becomes a bit challenging when trying to use a tone of voice is going to work all around the world. So one of the reasons for this is that you need to consider behaviors um, and attitudes and cultural um, expectations whilst you're considering that. So on this slide, we've included a few behaviors that might um, present a bit of a conflict in terms of how a tone of voice is interpreted or adapted um, just across different audiences. So you might have heard these terms, there's types of behavior defined by social science theory. Um, but in some cultures where they have more of a collectivist sense um, of their communities, they prize selflessness or working together for the greater good. Um, they'll focus more on family and local community connections. It can be hard to meet and connect with others because people are already in their units and they're established. They prize conformity. Um, and you can often find these kinds of cultures in Asia or Latin America. So if you contrast this with a more individualist type perspective, uh, cultures in Western countries predominantly really prize independence, self-expression. They focus much more on individual rights and you can connect with others through shared emotion. Um, and it also can be more stressed. I have observed this. Um, so really it's about understanding how you can appeal to these different types of cultures um, in a tone of voice that's going to work for both of them um, and express a brand. So this is just one way of looking at culture to give us some context. But next, we're going to have a run through a couple of examples to show what these kind of clashes can mean um, when it comes to content. So it looks like this is going to play a video, but it isn't. It's just actually a screenshot. Um, but this is an ad from Purple Bricks, the DIY real estate agent. Um, and if you can't read it, it says some estate agents put you through a lot of bull when selling your home. So if we think about the kinds of cultures that this might offend, it's going to be the collectivist side that will offend. It's showing disrespect for others, which is very against working together as a group. Um, even saying put you through 
is too focused on the individual here rather than the collective good. Um, the other piece of sensitivity that I would highlight here is um, some languages would think even that level of profanity around using bull, which applies another word that I won't say for aforementioned profanity. Um, but some US audiences are very sensitive to things like that. So again, that's something that can um, need to be considered quite carefully when it comes to adapting content for different locations. Uh, the next example I've got here, this is an ad from a vegan campaign group, and it was actually banned because the advertising standards agency said it was too disturbing for children. Um, we won't go into details, but the ingredients list did include body parts. Um, so there are lots of reasons why people either will or won't like this advertisement, but from an objective point of view, point of view, we think this wouldn't have landed well for individualist cultures. So people in these cultures value choice and they would find this kind of prescriptive view really judgy and not necessarily uh, empathetic. So the tones of voices that don't always work um, in different places, the things that we tell clients to watch out for um, is when it's going to be trying to be cute or playful. So sometimes that can be really problematic for um, societies which value hierarchy um, and a bit more traditional values. Um, it can seem a little bit rude or arrogant sometimes. Um, that confidence thing, the same point there applies. In, in some audiences, confidence can be perceived as excessively arrogant, whereas some people think that's absolutely fine. Again, American versus British culture is probably a good example of that. Um, formality is something that some languages and cultures treat very differently. Um, as an Australian, I've learned this the hard way sometimes. Um, and again, for some cultures, speaking directly to the audience in quite warm language, using a lot of personal language like you, might feel a bit over-friendly and too confronting. So from our point of view, this is where we really turn to our colleagues at Comtech, and that's uh, around that challenge of creating global tones of voices that work um, for a range of different audiences. And at this point, I'll hand over to Emily, who's going to take us from here on in, and I will do my best to drive the slides not badly. Thank you, Claire. Um, so yeah, as, as Claire mentioned, um, the where we kind of step in is offering that sort of multicultural, multilingual perspective. So um, where clients will often develop a a noticeable or recognizable brand in one language or market, often English in the UK or in the US first. Um, that is very much developed without the the understanding that translation and localization will be later down the line, or perhaps it, it very much is later down the line once a company is looking to go into a different market. So um, often the challenge that we are asked to support with is how do we take this global brand um, and make it now resonate in a particular target market or a target um, country. So taking that English tone of voice document can be a really good place to start because it ensures then that that, that brand, that company is still recognizable wherever you are around the world. Um, but often for all the reasons that Claire has already mentioned, um, adjustments might be needed um, for particular target markets where they shift quite significantly from a cultural perspective from um, the original source material. Thank you, Claire. So that comes on now to um, we're going to talk about best practice when it comes to translation and we're going to look at two different parts of the process. So um, very much kind of setting a project up for success. What do we need to do before we even touch a file and put it into a different language? Um, how can we be setting it up in the very best way that ensures a successful translation? And then what are the things that we can be doing during the actual translation process that that particular stage um, that ensures that the end product, the output of that process is as um, impactful as it possibly can be in the target market. Um, so, so these are some of the things that I'm going to be touching on now. Um, and these are kind of what we've identified as the most important things when setting up a project for success. So the secret to any successful project is taking the time to set it up well, briefing it incorrectly, um, and obviously translation is no different. So um, 
the the chances of a, a project of, of a translation landing well in a particular market all depends on getting these things right um claire if you don't mind just moving to the next slide um obviously we're going to say this but picking the right translation partner really does make a huge difference um even things like making sure that your partner has experience in the um subject area or the kind of content that you're working in for example does your translation partner have experience in translating ppc ads do they understand the character restrictions involved? Are they able to create content in a way that can navigate those restrictions, but still deliver an impactful end result? Do they um, understand and are they able to handle best practice when it comes to translating SEO and all the different complexities around that? Um, are they able to handle different file types? You know, if you're working with a CMS um, or you're working with design files that come from different software, are they able to handle those kind of things um, and be able to pr present back to you a, a translated version of the same document? Um, also looking at things like the skill and experience of the linguists involved. Um, as Claire mentioned earlier, we will only work with native speakers of a particular target language. So they have to have been born in that country. They have to have learned that language from birth and that that's the language that they use day in, day out in their personal and professional lives. They also have to be based in the target market as well so that they're constantly exposed to the way that culture is changing um, and the way that um, society and language continues to evolve. They also have to have a minimum of five years professional experience as well, which means that they've kind of made all the mistakes that they could have and should have made. Um, and they've learned from that and they've really refined their skill. Um, they also have to have a professional qualification, either in translation or in the language that they're translating into or out of as well. Um, so we can't just kind of work with anybody off the street who um, says that they've got a, a, a grasp of that particular language. There are certain standards and criteria that we have to make sure that we're meeting so that the output is exactly the quality that it needs to be. Um, and speaking of quality, um, sorry, go back to <laughs> Um, there are certain processes involved to make sure that we're doing everything we possibly can. So um, when you're looking at picking the right translation partner for you, think about how they're accessing the quality of their translators and the quality of their translations. What is their process for handling feedback? Um, do they have any quality certifications, for example, like ISO? Um, and what is the kind of additional expertise and support that they can offer you? So like I said, can they handle different file types? Do they have that in-depth cultural knowledge as well as the linguistic one? Are they able to advise on how something can really resonate with a particular target culture as well as a target language? and what are the kind of things that you need to be considering from that perspective. Thank you. Um, so next, looking at checking the, the brand's tone of voice, as I mentioned already, English can be a really great starting point. Um, but before we kind of think about going into translation, we need to be looking at things um, from a cultural perspective as well. So we would recommend that native speaking linguists carry out a cultural review um, of existing brand guidelines, tone of voice documents, and even source content as well. So they can be identifying whether the current guidelines will be resonating with readers and or an audience or consumers in a target market. Um, they can be looking at things like formality levels, for example, um, Claire mentioned already some cultural are extremely formal, especially when you're talking to a customer. Um, others really um, prioritize that friendliness, warm, informal approach. Um, and that will re really vary depending on the market that you're um, looking to explore. Um, also things like gender, what is the approach to gender neutrality um, in a particular target market? So um, in UK English, for example, we have they as a gender neutral pronoun that doesn't necessarily exist in every single language out there. There are languages where gender is very much hard coded into grammar. So we have to kind of think about what are ways that we can navigate around that so that we're being completely inclusive. Um, and that approach will vary very much um, even within a single language. French, for example, um, they might want to do masculine slash feminine. They might want to add things like asterisks um, or brackets to make sure that they're including everybody, um, no matter how they identify. Um, and so even within a particular culture or particular market, there are different ways. So that might be something that you ask your client or your um, internal team if you're working in another um, market. What's their preference in terms of how we handle things like that? Um, 
So once we've kind of completed a, a cultural review of, of tone of voice, we can be flagging then um, where any necessary changes might need to be made. Also, um, things like colour, as Claire mentioned earlier, um, imagery, that kind of thing. There's really kind of hidden aspects um, of a brand that might not necessarily resonate or might even cause offence in a particular target market. So things like the colour green, it's very friendly, it's very fresh for a, a UK perspective. Um, in Latin America, it can be... Um, in certain parts associated with death um, and in parts of China it can be associated with infidelity so there's a real contrast there in terms of meaning. Um, often what we find um, when we receive preferential feedback on translation, whether the style's not quite right or there's any um, particular stylistic um, or fluency aspects that, that haven't quite hit the mark is um, actually the the person that's reviewing and providing that feedback on the translation was never really going to like the English source content to begin with. Um, and that could be because they didn't see it to start with, or it could be that they um, didn't necessarily get the sign off. And um, there could be aspects of the English source material that are just completely at odds with their preferences um, and how um, a particular target market will speak. Um, so that's a really important part of the process when kind of uh, preparing content that will go for translation is getting that sign off of the source material first for the intended target audience. So um, if it, perhaps they don't necessarily resonate with the source material, we can be considering alternative service levels when it comes to the localization process. We could be looking at things like creative proofreading, which gives linguists additional license to move away from the source material. They could be um, really taking um, additional steps to be moving away. They could be adding additional idiomatic phrases for a particular target market. Um, they could be really looking at it as a, a cohesive piece of writing rather than kind of navigating a file line by line or sentence by sentence, but really kind of focusing on the impact of the source material rather than um, the sort of singular meaning. Um, we could also be looking at things like multilingual copywriting. So um, if the, the English source just isn't going to work in a particular target market, we could use that as a basis or point of reference for then creating some content directly from scratch in a particular target market. Um, other ways that we can be adapting content for a particular target market is looking at localization. And by that, we mean taking the English source material and making any necessary changes and adaptations to it before it goes for translation. So you might have a cultural reference in your English source content, which is hugely impactful for that particular target market. However, that's a very localized um, uh, reference for that particular whether it's UK English or US English, um, that's just not going to have the same impact in French or Spanish, for example. So we might want to look at adapting that source, that English sentence, so that it reflects an equivalent in the target market before we then even send the file um, to be translated. And finally, um, re reference material, which is a translator's very best friend. Um, and it's such a crucial part of ensuring that your project will be a success. Taking the time to compile reference material um, cannot be sort of underestimated. Um, it's an essential part of, of really making sure that that final output is exactly what it needs to be. Um, so it can include a variety of different materials, things like glossaries, style guides, um, existing translations, things like uh, websites, brochures, that kind of thing. Um, we also have a translation brief as well that we can share with clients. So that asks a number of different questions such as, um, what is your key audience? What are you looking to achieve from this translation? Um, do you have any preferences when it comes to things like formality? Um, what is the, the sort of uh, preferred tone of voice that you're looking for here? And is that different to the way that you're talking to people in your English content? Um, to try and capture as much up front and give translators a really solid brief in terms of um, the, the direction to follow in, when, when completing the translation. We also really, really recommend onboarding calls as well. And by that, we mean introducing your in-market contacts, whether that's your in-market client, your in-market colleagues, to the translators who will be completing the project. Um, that way they can talk about the um, preferences in their native language and they can really be um, 
sort of absorbed into what exactly your your client or your contact is looking for um, and they can get a really in-depth understanding of the brand um, and the the purpose of the project um, before the translation even begins um, so it's really really important to involve your in-market contacts your subject matter experts um, as early as possible so that they're really bought into the project as well um, and they're really kind of invested in its success as well um, and at this stage I'm going to hand over to Dan to talk about what actually happens during translation. Perfect thanks Anne. Um, so like like Emily and Claire have both mentioned um, putting in groundwork is, is is massive for kind of making sure your translation and, and localization projects do well and, and kind of succeed. But um, it doesn't all stop there. Um, there are some, some other kind of key stages that you can actually include within that translation workflow that are really going to boost the chances of, um, of success. And those kind of stages all center around one principle, um, and that is feedback is a good thing. Um, your your translation partner should should be welcoming feedback um, it's something that that linguists need um, to to be able to make sure that that your content can be localized effectively um, it's also um, a, a kind of another area that is quite culturally specific as well which is something to be mindful of um, different cultures provide feedback differently um, you get some cultures who will very readily provide feedback if you send something through. They quite happily read through, suggest changes that they might want to make. Um, there are other cultures who are a lot more reserved with feedback and they won't necessarily provide it that readily. They'll need to be kind of explicitly asked, look, can you suggest any, ch any changes that you'd like to make here? Um, to, so so it, it can be a little bit more, more difficult to, to kind of gain that feedback from them. So that's just something to to consider throughout the process. Um, the In order to kind of make sure you're getting as much feedback as possible, um, the, the first stage that we would always recommend including within, within a translation process is a sample stage. Um, this is particularly important in sort of the early stages of working with a new translation partner where sort of that reference material and, and that guidance might be slightly more limited. Um, but what this, this sample would look like is sort of 500, 1,000 words that's delivered nice and early in the process to give you or your or your client a chance to provide that initial feedback. Um, like I said, a, tra a translation partner should, should really welcome feedback. Um, and as early as they can get that feedback within the process, the better. Um, if if that, that kind of that feedback is provided nice and early on, what it means is that the linguist can then... And you're on mute. On mute, there we go. Um, the linguist can be taking those preferences um, and kind of working with those throughout the rest of the project. They can, they can be keeping those things in mind um, throughout, throughout the whole process. Going sort of hand in hand with that with that sample stage is also then a full market review stage. And again, particularly important in, in the early stages of working with a new partner. Um, that, that feedback is it's key. It's key to help the, the linguist to really, really understand the, the, the brand, the style and the tone that you're after in the translations. Um, when you're sort of looking at the, the feedback loop for translations, we we like to think of it very similar to the English, really. It's very rare that you would produce some content in English and without any kind of review, you just release it. Um, it's the same with same with translations. We always recommend getting that feedback, making any tweaks before things are released, just to make sure that everything is in line with the style and the tone that you're after. Um, the, the really good thing about sort of combining the initial sample with the full translation review um, is that if that sample has been done first and reviewed, the, the kind of the, the subsequent review stage should be a lot quicker. We, we fully accept that sort of your in-market colleagues, they've, this isn't their entire role. They've got other jobs to be doing. Um, if that sample stage has been done first, then this stage becomes more of a sort of 
sign off rather than um than kind of doing a full proofread and and suggesting um changes to the whole thing um what we do recommend is if you are including this this market review to sort of make best use of your colleagues time they should really be focusing on those sort of client specific things so specific terminology or specific stylistic things for for that particular client or that particular brand rather than sort of requesting preferential changes throughout once um once the project has kind of all been wrapped up and it's been completed we'd always um also really recommend a wash up call um which is a really good chance to to kind of do a few key things um one thing it lets you do is it lets you kind of debrief on the project some sort of final feedback might have come in after delivery it's a chance to chat through that um it lets you chat through any potential future projects that might be in the pipeline it lets your translation partner sort of line up resource accordingly for that and it also lets you talk about sort of ways of working um your translation partner should should want the process to be as smooth as possible um and again particularly when you're just setting up with a with a new partner having that conversation to talk about okay what did the process look like from your side was there anything you'd like to tweak are there any changes you'd want to make to that process it just lets you make sure that the process is working as smoothly as possible for everybody involved um and lets you sort of make sure that yeah you're, you're giving the project the right chance of of success um to make things nice and easy for you we've um we've, we've put together this kind of example workflow um to sort of out outline the the ideal translation process um obviously every project is slightly different there's always going to be specific things for 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 specific projects but broadly um if you're sort of following this process things will tend to work out tends to work out pretty well um to to kick things off we've got the sort of the briefing and the setup things that, that Emily's just spoken through. So things like the onboarding calls, uh, getting hold of reference material, signing off the, the English content and tone of voice and things like that. Um, and then once that's completed, moving on to the sample translation stage and then that sample review. So this is that chance to provide the early feedback that the linguist can then take forward into the next stage which is the main translation. Um, when that's been done, again, like we said, we recommend the full, the full translation review. But if that sample review has been completed, then really this should be more of a more of a sign-off stage rather than a full review. Um, if, if we are including a sort of translation review stage in the process, then what we'd always recommend is then including a finalization stage where any changes would be sent back to the linguist for them to finalize and sign off. Um, this gives the linguist a chance to um, check that there's no sort of typos or errors or anything in, uh, introduced during that review stage. Um, it also lets, um, lets the linguist check that those changes have been implemented um, sort of consistently throughout the, the entire document. Sometimes a reviewer might make one change and expect it to then be implemented throughout. So it just gives the linguist the chance to, to check that. Um, then once the project's been done, we've got the wash up call that we just talked through, which is again, that chance to sort of talk through any last feedback or any projects that might be in the pipeline. So like I said, the, the, no two projects are ever the same. There's always gonna be specifics with, with, with individual projects, but if you work with your translation partner to kind of follow this broad process, it's going to put you in a really good position to make sure that the, the kind of the project goes as smoothly as possible and it will give your localized content the, the biggest chance of being as impactful as possible. Thanks, Dan, and um, thanks, Emily. Thanks, Claire. Um, so we just thought we'd wrap up with some key takeaways um, as we've discussed today. So hopefully, um, it's been it's become clear that it's not just language that needs translating; it really is that cultural nuance. Um, so to get that right, here are kind of the key things that you need from the outset. Uh, so you need base content created with an awareness of cultural nuance. That's obviously where Stratton Craig can really help in that area. Um, a tone of voice that can be adapted to different cultures. 
access to the cultural expertise you need, that's really context um, expertise and, and space there, uh, an understanding of the complexities of large scale translation projects and the real um, thorough processes and project management designed to evade um, common uh, pitfalls. So obviously, we would say that, um, we would, would say this, but these are the things that cop uh, expert copywriting and translation partners can provide. Um, so, of course, if it is of any interest to, to anyone attending today um, to discover a bit more about how Strat and Craig and Comtech really work in these areas and how we might support, then please do feel free to reach out to um, all four of us, either by email or on LinkedIn. Um, but just to wrap up, we do have a couple of questions that have come in that I'd like to put to um, our panelists today, if that's OK. So um, first question is, what do you um, think are the parts of the translation or copywriting process that people often forget to really pay that attention to and why? Um, Emily, Dan? I think from a translation perspective, um, it's actually just the, the actual translation part itself that can often be an afterthought. I think content is quite often just created in a single language first, and then translation is maybe two or three steps down the line. Um, so often there's that kind of step where you have to think, okay, it's been created like this, it's not necessarily set up well yet for translation. So what are the things that we kind of need to back, back uh, track on to make this now suitable um, for, for different markets and different languages? Yeah, I think that um, kind of always comes across, particularly when we have our conversations about our joint clients. We often, um, when we're talking about the services that you guys offer, uh, offer, clients will come to us thinking it's translation, just translation that they need. But actually, that's when you start to talk about that kind of transcreation mm. process and, and really the value. Yeah. yeah, I think it's the reference material part as well that can often be um, forgotten about is actually how important it is um, and why it's so necessary to, to do all that upfront work. I think, you know, it's, it's a, a common misconception that we can just launch straight into translation, but actually the the amount of prep work up front is is hugely underestimated and that's often where the, the success will lie. Yeah. And I guess similar kind of response from a cop English copywriting point of view, Claire, that kind of what's some of that initial prep that some people just have a bit of an oversight on. Well, I think it comes down to awareness a little bit. Um, we're lucky here at Threat and Craig because a lot of our um, writers and our account team have a, a really international perspective, having lived overseas, um, worked in different places, so they understand that British English isn't the only way to speak English. Um, but if you don't have that perspective, you may not necessarily be aware that some of the language you're using is only culturally specific in one market. So, you know, I think Emily's right. It's about knowing that the content needs to be translated and taking steps at the outset um, to make sure that you're considering that in the words you choose. I think there's, there's also kind of design elements in there as well. I think that's something that we often come across if we're looking at kind of uh, brochures or e-learning modules, things that have been sort of typeset. Realistically, English is a relatively short language um, and other languages like German, Dutch, French kind of a, a, a considerably longer. Um, if you're creating English content and it's all kind of all the all the text is kind of really tightly fitting into different text boxes and different design elements and things like that, it's going to cause issues when when you're then kind of looking at translating it into into other languages. So. I think, yeah, there's also those those sort of more design elements to think about upfront, kind of, okay, is this going to be localised? If so, let's kind of make sure there's plenty of gaps for, for kind of text to run into and things like that, obviously without kind of huge white spaces everywhere, but just to make sure that those things are considered um, for, from an early stage as well. Um, and another question is, um, is there a threat from AI at all in terms of translation? Um, I don't know if any of you, if you guys have an opinion on that at all. Um, yeah, I think that's the the kind of the, the big question that everybody's asking um, at the moment, really. It's AI and sort of machine translation have have absolutely got a got a place in in the translation industry. Um, it's about how they can be how they can be kind of understood and harnessed and and, and used well. Um, there are some kind of some kinds of content where yeah uh, an AI or machine translation approach really works so kind of super technical things or kind of legal documents things like that that machine translation or or AI approach can work really well um, but 
it, it does have its limitations and I think it's it's you need to kind of always remember that look it's it's not sort of a a magical cure thing that's going to kind of solve all of your problems there are a lot of things kind of like the the cultural elements the the more stylistic elements that it does really struggle with and um it's about understanding that yes it has a place and just knowing when to when to use it really yeah i think a lot of people you know not even within the translation industry specifically but in you know things like the lnd industry it's kind of being considered as just another tool that can help us do our job so it's not necessarily replacing anybody's role in the process it's facilitating it and it's um kind of enhancing it where it's appropriate to do that um and kind of building off what dan just said you know it absolutely has its place um and there's certain kinds of content that works really well there's also certain languages where it works really well those high resource languages or those more kind of straightforward languages if you like where the grammatical structure is quite similar to to english if that's your source language um but there's other languages that are hugely complex from a, a grammatical standpoint where it's just definitely not good enough yet um like Finnish and Hungarian for example and so I think our kind of perspective and I think most people within all industries really perspective is keeping that human in the loop um you know I'm sure that you guys wouldn't kind of use any kind of AI with it without multiple human people checking it first um and that's very much the same approach that we would take is it's it's there and it's great um but we have a commitment to our clients to to deliver quality and regardless how we get there that that commitment won't change absolutely and i think that it kind of goes against um the qualification criteria that you were talking about earlier that you your linguists are are native they're born in that country so yeah um it's very similar approach to what we've got at chat and craig um and the last question just to um wrap up on is um what do you think is the hardest language to translate and, and why I think that's a really good question I think any language where there is a significant cultural stretch from the source so if our source language is English anything that is hugely different not only in terms of, of language but also in terms of cultural background as well so I would say maybe languages like Japanese where there's a, a huge difference you know Claire was mentioning earlier um the difference between collectivist and individualist cultures that is one particular aspect of culture that is hugely different from English um you've also got things um different aspects of culture so looking at the Hofstede model for example where um there's a huge power distance um difference as well so here in the UK we are um, not really that deferential in terms of hierarchy within a workplace, for example. Um, there's obviously respect towards older members of the community, but there's not that kind of same level of, um, of deferential behavior. Whereas in other um, cultures, even in, even in France, for example, there's that huge um, respect um, element there where you use vous rather than tu when you're talking to somebody you don't know or somebody who is considered superior to you in a professional context um, so anything where there is that what we call a cultural stretch I think poses an additional level of complexity when you're when you're looking at translation. I was interested when Dan said about how that impacts feedback as well I lived in Japan for a long time and I know that Japanese when they say something isn't great will say you know it's chotto which means it's a little bit and that is enough for a Japanese person to know, oh, it's absolutely rubbish. But if you translated that directly, British people can think that, oh, yeah, it's fine. They said it was like a little bit, but it's fine. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that you you really need to, I say, a, a lot of kind of Asian languages, it's where we tend to find it, where it's it's potentially more more difficult to get that, or not more difficult, but they just word things in a different way that you almost need to, you need to really um, look at that feedback and analyze it from a cultural perspective to to really understand what what it is that that that, that they're trying to to kind mm -hmm. of feed back. And be a bit more creative when asking for feedback as well. So typically we will we will share files in a bilingual format and you know ask them to make any changes that they feel are relevant for their company or or target market. Um, but for for other cultures, we kind of have to be a little bit more creative in the ways that we're asking for feedback so we might give them feedback surveys for example and ask very specific questions on elements of the translation things like fluency terminology that kind of thing um or we might need to kind of go to the most senior member of the team because that's the person that they feel is is most 
the best place to deliver feedback and um, so yeah you kind of have to think about all the different ways to to ensure that you have definitely got things right um and kind of go from there well thank you um well i think that that wraps us up unless um yeah, anyone has any further final thoughts to leave us on or well, we've covered covered a lot of ground today well, good. Well, thank you very much for joining um, everyone. We'll, um, the, we'll follow up with the slides and for all that's have attended um, and the recording will be available as well in case you ever want to watch back. Um, but as I say, any questions about the way that Strat and Craig and Comtech work together, feel, um, please feel free to reach out to any of us and have a great day. Thank you Thanks very much, everyone. everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye.